Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining Smart Data Sprinting Open Conference. I am Jana Jocely Omena, and on behalf of the organizing committee, I want to briefly introduce to you the purpose of this event, which is reuniting uh, we all here today to hear and, and learn from Yusef Van Dijk on the current state of platformization. So this is the edition number five of the Smart Data Sprint which is an environment uh, to foster collaboration, reflection, to reflect, discuss, and critique ways of conducting studies with the digital methods approach. It's an event organized and promoted by Innova Media Lab. And over the past few years, we received uh, researchers from all over the place to develop projects here. We are a group of researchers, um, who develop social media research techniques and research tools for media studies and digital social sciences. So, and this three, uh, these five people you see, that is the organizing committee of this event. This year, uh, our edition has uh, hitted our record. So we have a total of 70 participants, which are all right now engaging with six different projects but uh, the last couple of days, they also engaged and attended different practical labs, a short talk, a keynote, and a masterclass. But without further delay, I'm going to pass the word to Bernard Reeder, who is introducing our distinguished guest, and we are all looking forward for, for her talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jana. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, evening, or well, whatever time it may be in your uh, time zone. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Josef van Dijk, who is uh, a former colleague of mine. Uh, she uh, was a, a professor in media studies at the University of Amsterdam, where she was also uh, the Dean of the Humanities uh, uh, faculty. And uh, between 2015 and 2018, she was the first female president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and uh, also voted the most influential woman in the Netherlands by monthly magazine OPSI in 2016. Um, she's now a distinguished professor of media and digital society at uh, Utrecht University. And I'm not gonna, you know, kind of provide like an overview of, uh, of her full activities and publications. That would be uh, almost, uh, almost impossible. Um, but I really wanna mention um, two of her uh, books. Uh, first, 2013, The Culture of Connectivity, A Critical History of Social Media. And more recently, together with Thomas Poole and Martijn de Waal, um, The Platform Society, Public Values in a Connective World. Um, and I think from those two titles, you can already see that her work um, combines the analysis of the platform society and platform life with an increasing focus on the question, which values should guide our attempts at shaping and regulating platforms. And I've, I've just taken out two quotes from, uh, from some recent, uh, from a recent publication that um, maybe, you know, already give you an idea where uh, uh, this work is going. Uh, the first one is, um, uh, Jose writes, online digital platforms have deeply penetrated every sector in society, disrupting markets, labor relations, and institutions, while transforming social and civic practices. Moreover, platform dynamics have affected the very core of democratic processes and political communication, right? And I think this is really this, this uh, descriptive part, the analytical part that then asks for, uh, you know, our as a researcher, as a citizen, uh, uh, our position uh, towards these, uh, these phenomena. And she then writes, there is a need to articulate values that pertain to much broader so societal issues such as democratic control of the public sphere, a level playing field for all actors, anti-discrimination practices, fairness in taxation and labor, and clarity with regards to shared responsibility and accountability. Public values are not a simple set of rules that you can buy off the shelf and implement in society. On the contrary, they are disputed and negotiated at uh, every level of governance. And I think Jose is one of the chief negotiators in that, uh, <laughs> in that process. And, and uh, yeah, for, for me, uh, one of the most interesting voices to be heard. 
Um, the question of public values is, of course, a global one, but it challenges Europe in specific ways. I think on the level of both our specific value traditions, but also in terms of um, political institutions. And uh, tonight's talk of European perspective on platformization is, I think, uh, going to tackle this specificity of, um, of Europe in this context. I also hear that the metaphor of the tree will be um, <laughs> will play a, a big role. So I'm uh, very curious um, uh, uh, to hear uh, to hear your talk, um, Jose. But just a, a small uh, footnote before um, this uh, is happening. I think uh, within the. The, the Zoom frame of a webinar where you can uh, ask questions via the Q&A function. Uh, um, so uh, uh, Jeanne and I, we're going to have a, an eye on that and we're going to then uh, relay these questions uh, to uh, Jose at the, at, uh, at the end. I think she's going to speak uh, uh, for somewhere between 50 minutes and an hour and we then have um, yeah, maybe 20, 30 minutes uh, for, uh, for uh, questions. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and uh, you say the floor is yours. The screen is yours. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Um, I'm first going to share the screen with you all. Um, there you go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Benar, can you see my screen? Okay, <laughs> just wanted to make sure. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction, Bernard. I was actually just going to listen to you because you were almost, you know, so good at explaining what my work is about. And I hope I won't disappoint you. So um, uh, if there's anything that, uh, you know, if there's something technical, technically going wrong, please let me know through the chat and Bernard will inform me because we can't hear each other. And uh, I hope you see me enough. I hope you can disregard the sheep. That is just a picture that I uh, that I took. And first of all, I would like to say a word, a few words to you in Lisbon, because um, it really breaks my heart that, you know, I can't be with you in Lisbon uh, tonight. I would have loved to, and I will certainly do that at some, some point. But uh, of course, my heart goes out to all these people who are sick with COVID-19, who have uh, caught Corona. And um, I really hope that, you know, this pandemic will come to an end soon because I miss a lot of my colleagues these days. And uh, I know that you do too. But hopefully through this screen, we can still share some uh, interesting, you know, arguments tonight. And um, well, if I can't answer all your questions, I still hope that, you know, you have picked out some of the the points that I want to make. So tonight I would like to share a few thoughts with you on the European perspective on platformization. And, uh, you know, I, by means of introduction, I think I'm throwing a lot of, just a lot of problems at you. For the past 20 years or so, digital platforms have created enormous wealth for, com for companies, but they've also had, you know, created very many, many benefits for users. The kind of problems that they've generated are both problems for users and for societies as such. Um, here's a list, it's not exhaustive, but just a few problems that we've encountered over the past few years. Disinformation and hate speech, uh, fake news, trolling, election intervention, particularly in the US, not just in 2016, but also more recently in, uh, no, in the, the elections in November. And the aftermath, of course, that we will certainly talk a little bit more about. Um, we have seen antitrust issues arise. Uh, November 2020, Google was taken to court by the US government, but also by the EU. It was fined at least three big fines. We have seen privacy scandals, security leaks, uh, tax evasion, the undermining of labor laws. This list could be longer and you know than um, I have projected here but uh, long story short long-standing values that promote an open society and that of course are values like tolerance like democracy like fairness like autonomy those values are compromised in an online world that is currently dominated by mostly American digital platforms and that is you know what I would like to talk about today. Um, in European countries, but also in the US, there seems to be a recent, more for the past couple of years, there seems to be a tech lash. 
And in the tech, the tech lash means that, you know, it wants to hold to keep big tech companies responsible for a lot of different problems in today's societies. And here you see a few takes from the news media over the past few months, how to take on the tech barons. Um, the other one is from uh, the US Congress last October. I just said that re uh, uh, um, issued a report that holds uh, big tech accountable for a lot of these problems. And then, of course, um, just recently, three weeks ago, after January on January 6, we saw another major, you know, uh, development in the uh, evolution of platforms. When uh, after the siege of the Capitol in Washington, first Donald Trump was kicked up off of Facebook, Twitter, and then maybe even more importantly, Parler, one of the more fringe platforms was refused cloud services from Amazon and kicked out of the app stores. Major developments in the evolution of the ecosystem, as I will uh, talk more about later. Now, due to this tech clash, a lot of governments, not just the US, but also European governments, have started calling for breaking up big tech because these companies have become too powerful. And tonight, I would like to talk a bit more about the power of uh, uh, platforms, but particularly about platformization. And my main leading question today is, how can we govern public values in open platform societies, particularly in Europe? So that will be my major, my main question. And I've sort of uh, cut up my lecture in uh, five parts. First, I will talk more a little bit more explanatory. I will explain what I mean by uh, uh, platform ecosystems. I will particularly um, uh, focus in, zoom in on what is exactly platformization. Why do we call it like that? What are public values um, in contrast, for instance, to economic values of corporate platform ecosystems? Who are the responsible actors? And finally, I will be talking more about the challenges for Europe. What are really the, cha really the challenges for Europe? Um, there's two, uh, Bernard, Bernard was very nice to already mention uh, my book, uh, the book that I wrote with Thomas Poole and Martijn de Waal, uh, The Platform Society. Some of my explanatory issues are taken from that book. Also some of the, um, uh, uh, the images come from that book. And more recently, last summer, I published an article called Seeing the Forest for the Trees. And that was published by New Media and Society. And I will also pick the, the tree metaphor that I've promised to explain comes from that article. So just in case you want to go back to these references, you're welcome to do so. Now, let me talk by let me uh, start by talking about what are platform ecosystems. This is pretty basic. Some of you who may have read my work already know a lot about it or know what I'm going to talk now, but it's just to set the stage. Um, the global online world is driven by platforms and fueled by data flows. But those platforms and data flows can be steered both by companies and by states. There are two platform, platform ecosystems in the world that are dominant. One is the American and the other one is Chinese. And I'll start with the Chinese um, uh, ecosystem. That system is controlled by the state, but it's operated mostly by three companies. Baidu, Alibaba, Alibaba is the sort of the Chinese Amazon and Tencent. And Tencent, you probably know that because it operates WeChat. That is sort of the uh, equivalent of Facebook. We call that by the acronym of the BAT system. Now, Alibaba and Tencent are increasingly becoming very powerful in this system. They're branching out from their core business in pretty much every sector in society, from online shopping to mobility, to finance, to pay systems. You're probably familiar with Alipay, for instance. And in fact, they have become gatekeepers to the entire economy, wielding power over brick and mortar enterprises through, for instance, integrated pay systems, through communication channels, through groceries, online grocery stores, pharmacies, healthcare, and so on and so forth. Now, in that bad system, the Chinese government has strict control over companies' data steering. So ultimately, the government, the state, controls access to uh, every private citizen's data. Uh, 
I'm actually not going to talk a lot about the Chinese system because I'm going to concentrate on the American ecosystem, the platform ecosystem that is dominated by the big five tech companies that all of you are pretty much familiar with. And those are, of course, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft, also going by the name, the acronym of GAFA. And this ecosystem pretty much dominates what I call the rest of the world, Europe, the Americas, Asia, except for China, and Africa. And American tech companies, it's not true that these two big ecosystems are sort of, you know, uh, insular opposite. And the American tech companies have actually tried many times to enter the Chinese ecosystem, but either they were, bar they were barred, they were censored, or they were forced to align with Chinese companies. Google search, for instance, has had to withdraw after Chinese um, uh, after the Chinese censored their search engine. And Facebook stopped its activities in China after it had tried very hard to enter it, but it pretty much lost the competition to WeChat. Apple, by the way, is still very active in China. Almost 40% of its app store revenue comes from the Chinese market. So there are very much interjections back and forth. Now, vice versa, the US is trying to bar, for instance, over the past uh, recent six months, trying to bar Chinese companies from entering American markets like WeChat, but particularly TikTok. You must have he heard about the attempts by the American government to bar and uh, to um, uh, uh, defend the American system against uh, being taken over by TikTok because they are a, a very serious competitor of, for instance, Twitter and Facebook. Now, these company, this this back and forth of platform uh, uh, platforms between China and America, that really has become the subject of fierce geopolitical and particularly ideological contests. And part of that ideological contest is, of course, about it's about systems. The two systems that I just uh, uh, noted are apparently entirely different based on different assumptions. In the American system, data are owned and exploited by corporations, particularly those big five. And it creates a huge potential for corporate surveillance uh, of online activities. That uh, corporate surveillance is underpinned by what we call libertarian capitalism. Now, on the other hand, on the right side, you see the Chinese system where data are owned by the state, basically, or can be accessed by the state. All citizens' online activities, even if they are mediated by corporate platforms, they are subject to state surveillance. And that is all underpinned by the ideology of state capitalism. Now, once again, although these two systems are ideologically very, very different. They are intertwined at many levels. Unfortunately, I can't go into details tonight because that's not what my talk is about, but it's really true that they are connected in many different ways at many levels. That's for another talk. Now, because tonight I really want to focus on Europe and squeeze between those two systems, the US and China, is of course Europe, which has very important, no major tech for firms that are part of one of these uh, uh, big ecosystems. Even though, and I don't deny that, Europe has nourished a few major platforms. For instance, Estonia started Skype, but then Skype was bought up by Microsoft, as you know. Sweden has created Spotify, but Tencent is now a major shareholder of Spotify. And as a proud Dutch uh, uh, citizen, I can add that Atyen is a pay system that is, has now become a unicorn and is you know, pretty important as a company, but it's a single uh, platform system. So despite a handful of unicorns, all these major platforms are run by American or Chinese firms. Alibaba, for instance, is increasingly active in Europe, and so is its rival Amazon, of course, in setting up the digital marketplace. So for online services, when it comes to online services, Europe has become pretty much largely dependent on American platform, platform ecosystem. 
And this has become a political liability as Europe is now caught between the superpower fight over technological control. And that is creating a lot of geopolitical tensions. Now, for the remainder of this lecture, I will focus mostly on the American ecosystems with these five big players, the big corporate players that I just mentioned. Um, in terms of market value, these big five companies, if they were together, if they together formed a state, they would be the fifth largest economy after the US, after China, Germany, and Japan. For instance, in 2020 alone, Apple, Apple by itself, the company by itself, reached the largest market value in the history of corporations when, as you probably know, it hit the mark of $1 trillion. If that were a GP, uh, GPA, uh, GDP, then uh, you know how big that country would be. But more than market value, I think this platform ecosystem is about societal power and influence. European democracies have become increasingly dependent on this online ecosystem, causing Europe to lose control over the governance of their economies, not just their economies, but also their societies. And that by that, I mean the way they organize and control not just their economic systems, but their uh, uh, democracies as such. Now, let me come to this the next question, what exactly is platformization? And particularly in the context of that American ecosystem, how do platforms exercise power and how do they impact the democratic societies in Europe and elsewhere? And now we come to my tree. Bernard already introduced it, but that is sort of a metaphor that I use in order to explain how platforms work. Now, to this to explain how power is distributed and accumulated i have to first explain that not all platforms are equal some are actually more equal than others so i distinguish between three types of platforms one type is the the kind of platforms you find in uh, in the root layer and that is what i call the digital infrastructure the second kind of platforms is what i call the intermediary uh, platforms and that layer is what I call the trunk. Finally, uh, I distinguish sectoral platforms and those are, um, you know, what I call the branches. Now, I'm going to explain each of these three levels to you, but uh, if you if you are interested in, you know, a very precise explanation of the details, you need to go back to that article I published in New Media and Society, and you will also find all the, the images that I use here today. But first, a preliminary note, there is no clear, you see the lines here, the blue lines, but in fact, there is no clear boundary between each of these levels. They gradually morph and they basically obliterate the boundaries between them. And that is the process I call platformization. And in that process of platformization, the intermediary level, which is the trunk, is actually the center of power. Now, let me start with the first level. And the first level are the roots of the tree. And that mostly happens below the surface. But the roots signify the digital, digital infrastructural systems on which the internet is built. I can't go through all of these, you know, the different uh, uh, layers in between, but I just mention a few. First, there are like material infrastructure, such as cables, satellites, etc. You have, you know, the next layer like internet exchange points or semiconductors. They enable the networks like the internet and intranets. And those, of course, are coded protocols that help identify every location with an IP address, for instance, the World Wide Web. And of course, there's a domain name system for proper routing and the delivery of the delivery of messages. Now, on top of that, you will find in this underground layer, it is root layer, data, uh, data center facilities. Think of Facebook, Microsoft and Amazon. Currently in the Netherlands, they are the companies that are building our data centers and that, that, that operate you know, the hardware and the software that is built on top of that, which I come to in just a second. 
And then finally, I did also want to mention consumer hardware. That is definitely part of this layers. Uh, layer devices such as laptops, phones, uh, uh, tablets, home assistants. Some of these um, hardware devices are uh, owned and operated by uh, the big five. Think of your iPhone, personal assistants like Siri, but also, you know, the Google Chrome laptops, Amazon Alexa, etc., etc. That was the first layer. Now we come to the most important layer, the center of power. What is, it, you know, if we go up the tree, what kind of platforms do we find there? In that trunk, you know, and that trunk is really the mediation, the, the, the media intermediary level between the infrastructure and the users. So what we find there is, for instance, cloud services. Cloud services, of course, are important for data storage, for analytics, for distribution. Think of Google, Google Cloud, uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS. If we move up to trunk, I'm not going to mention all of those, but we find identification or login services. Think of your Facebook ID, Google ID, Amazon ID, Apple ID, etc. And pay systems, for instance, Apple Pay and Google Pay pretty much share that market. Further up, we find advertising services. Advertise, the big online advertisers are Facebook and Google. The market is pretty much 80% dominated by those two. Search engines, well, most of you know Google Search owns pretty much, I think it's 91 or 92% of the European market. Microsoft Bing is one of their tiny, tiny competitors, but it's you know still 7% or so. Um, mail and messaging services, think of Facebook Messenger, Gmail, uh, Microsoft Outlook. Then we get the app stores, very important. There's only two app stores that pretty much control that market, and that's Apple App Store, Google Play Store. Then we come to social networking. Well, there's pretty much one monopolist there, that's Facebook, which also owns Instagram, WhatsApp. YouTube is another one that you may call social network owned by Google. And then, of course, we have retail networks. Online retailers are Amazon Marketplace and Google Shopping. So what you're seeing, particularly in this layer, is that the majority of each of these layered services is operated by one or two or three of the big five companies. Sometimes there's five, but you know it's it's either a monopoly, a duopoly, or an, what we call an olig oligopoly, which is a word that I can you know hardly pronounce. Finally, let's go to the branches, the branches of the tree. Um, they commonly serve what I call a particular sector, such as news and German journalism. Think of Google News, but there are many. There's more diversity in these branches than there is in the trunk. Think of education. Um, Google Apps for Education, for instance, is an important player here. Think of healthcare. Google Health, Fitbit. By the way, Fitbit was of course bought up by Google just last year. Uh, media, AV streaming. In short you will find, although these GAFAM platforms have an increasing, also an increasing presence in the branches in the various sectors, there is still more diversity in this layer, in this sectoral layer, than there is in the intermediary la layer, in the trunk. Now, what characterizes this platform ecosystem is its enormous concentration of power in the trunk. Once you own and operate one or more intermediary platform markets in that trunk layer, you can actually exercise control over data flows through the various mechanism, mechanisms that I have um, summarized here. And to get a more precise explanation, you really need to go to the article, but very briefly, um, vertical integration means that the data flows that flow across all three levels of the tree, from the, the roots all the way to the branches, and have to flow through the trunk. Um, if you own all three uh, uh, data flows at all three levels, you are able to connect them in the back end. So companies who can do that, who can make that vertical integrated connection, they can provide, for instance, personalized services, and they can combine those services. A second part of platformization power is what I call infrastructuralization. 
And that means that the monopolies or the duopolies that I just mentioned, in, in the, particularly in the trunk, that they have become the bottlenecks for the entire ecosystem. If you don't own and operate some of those intermediary layers, you don't have control over the vertical integration of those data flows. And finally, data monetization. By that, I mean that platforms can control and monetize combined data sets. I'm not going to explain to you in, in more detail because that's too detailed how that monetization happens, but you can read that in the book. Just a very brief example. Uh, let's take Google. Google, um, of course, offers uh, Chrome laptops. You know, they, that's the, the, in, the, in the root layer. They are used in schools. They have built in operating software. It runs on Google Cloud. It offers, you know, basic software like Google Search and Google Maps and Google Scholar and Google, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> There's so many Google services. And also uh, in the branch, at the branch level, Google Apps for Education. But by means of, for instance, the Google ID function, what Google can do is to connect all those data flows across the system, vertically integrate in the back end how those data flows can be monetized into, you know, either through advertising or through uh, basically ask, asking for money. Okay, um, how else can American platforms, how have they become so powerful, not just economically, but now also socially? An important point there is that digital platforms have acquired an exceptional legal status. And that is due to the American law. This is very precise, but it's due to Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, which was uh, which came into being in 1996. This is eons ago. This is like centuries ago in, in terms of, you know, internet time. But what this law does is that it exempts digital platforms from liability regarding the content that users place on their platforms. For instance, Facebook and Twitter, they are not liable for content that users place on their platforms. This law was okay in 1996 when there were hardly any platforms and there was hardly an eco there was no ecosystem at all. Actually, the men the the law was uh, implemented uh, because they wanted to stimulate innovation. Now, 25 years later, the law is under huge uh, governmental scrutiny because it has. Um, now that you know the big five control the gateways to the ecosystem, they have also gained not just huge economic power, but no corresponding societal responsibility. And that is why this law is now sort of the focus of a lot of you know that tech clash um, uh, uh, complaints. Now I come to public values because. The American ecosystem is built, as I just explained, as a corporate infrastructure driven by solely on economic values. But what about public values? What about public responsibility? In this ecosystem, there's hardly any public space, a space that is not controlled by private corporations. And public values often sit in tension with the commercial values that structure the architecture of the system that we're bound by, that we're uh, uh, called into. Now, just briefly about public values, because you know this could be a book by itself, but I tried to introduce it to you in just two slides. What kind of public values are relevant and how are they accounted for in that proprietary platform ecosystem? There are actually a number of public values that pertain to online users as individuals, such as security and transparency. Well, we don't want our data to be hacked or stolen. We expect privacy, you know, we respect platforms that they respect the boundaries of our personal information. And we expect to use an online service on transparent conditions. So these are the kind of public values that we expect as consumers. For instance, we expect accurate information or accurate news when we use health platforms or when we consume news. Over 50% of all the news that we consume on the internet goes is distributed through Facebook. So 
we can actually, we have this expectation of that Facebook is perpetrating those kind of public values, which they obviously are not in essence responsible for due to that section 230. But beyond consumer oriented public values, other values pertain to basically to society as a whole. We expect from platforms that they act in accordance with values such as fairness, such as inclusiveness, um, uh, at autonomy, uh, democratic control, accountability. And these public values often sit in tension with the commercial values. For instance, you know, our values like accurate information, they clash with a user's appetite or uh, advertisers or uh, trolls push for misinformation. Very important, and I think Bernard mentioned this in his introduction, public values are not fixed. You know, you can't buy them off the shelf and just implement them. They're actually, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to show you my slide. That is why I was, you probably didn't understand my, my next uh, uh, words. That's because I, I can't see the right side of my screen because the, the, the pictures are on there, the, the images. So public values are not fixed. They're negotiated and they're balanced off by between you know, users and uh, platform providers at very different levels. So, for instance, the algorithms that enable personalized learning in a classroom, they may clash with student privacy and, for instance, with teachers' professional autonomy. So those different public values need to be balanced off, not perhaps not just in the classroom, but also in the sector of uh, education. So that is important to know and to, as a takeaway on public values. That brings up an even bigger question, you know, for those in with regards to those public values, who is who actually is responsible for guarding public values in the platform society? And here you see in a in a drawing, um, in fact, a very simple answer: we are all responsible for governing the digital society. Now, there's a number of stakeholders that are involved in organizing the platform ecosystem as what I call a democratic space. But analytically, we distinguish between three types of actors, market, state, and civil society. Now, from a market perspective, we see that businesses, consumers, and entrepreneurs can be responsible actors. Platforms can be responsible actors. From a state perspective, we look at local, national, supranational governments who can actually take care of regulation, for instance. From a civil society perspective, we're very much looking at citizens' initiatives, uh, cooperatives, public institutions that help us build that responsible uh, society. And ideally, and this is particularly the European perspective, ideally there is a balance between market, state and civil society actors resulting in what we call a multi-stakeholder organization. However, each global ecosystem and both, you know, the American and the Chinese, they have each uh, gravitated towards one side. The Chinese have gravitated towards the state, you know, as a prominent or dominant actor, whereas the American system has gravitated towards the market. And Europe, that will be part of my um, uh, 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 my takeaway tonight, tonight, tonight will need a balance between those three levels. If we look at the American ecosystem on the left, that is, uh, I have imagined that as an American sequoia, the Gafan system, and on the right you see what I call the, the Chinese bamboo tree. In the American ecosystem, data from citizens are controlled through platforms, as I just told you. In the Chinese system, data flows and platform power are concentrated also in very tall trunks, but there the state is in control. Now in Europe, both systems actually pose serious problems. Problem one, there's no democratic control in either one of these ecosystems. The lack of transparency and accountability is actually becoming pretty problematic as it results in, for instance, misinformation or surveillance. Second problem is that data are either proprietary in the American system or 
they are controlled by the state in the, Amer in the Chinese system. Citizens by themselves have no control over their own data and neither have public institutions control over data as a common good. Problem three is that ecosystems, both e uh, either one of them, lacks open public space. European platform societies, I think, are predicated on that very precarious balance between companies, states, and civil society. But these are the, 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 mo the main problems in that system. So, in other words, Europe needs a different system, a different, different ecosystem based on democratic public values. But does that mean that the EU governments have to create their own ecosystem from scratch? And can they do that? Which is an even more important question. Can they desi design their own social media platforms, their data centers, their hardware devices? In short, can they design another tree? That, I think, will be pretty hard. But what they need to do and what they need to do urgently is to articulate the rules and restrictions that uphold democracy's core principles in the ecosystem on which it is building um, its democracies. Now, Europe, particularly the European Union, may not be able to grow a new kind of tree, as you see in my, you know, my last, um, in the third picture. Uh, but it can certainly help redesign a tree that doesn't have a tall, thick trunk with centralized concentration of power, but a tree that sort of shapes into a short trunk and a diversity of branches, right? That is my sort of ideal image. Now, I think that democratically governed ecosystems really need to invest in an open infrastructure and that they need to give equal space to market, state, and civil society stakeholders. So how we do, do how are we going to do this? I'm not going to explain this image in detail to you. You can uh, read that in the article, but in brief, to grow a European platform tree, I think it's imperative to redesign the architecture of infrastructural, intermediary, and sectoral platforms to create enough diversity to allow for public services that can be created in this overwhelmingly private online space. Um, a very important requirement to do that is interoperability and diversity. Those are two terms that I discuss at length in that article, but just briefly, um, they allow users the ability to freely move and switch between services oper operated by different platform providers. And those platform providers can be both public and private in the various la uh, layers. So in short, what what needs to be done is to make sure that users can switch between public, all kinds of private platforms at any moment in you know, these different layers. So to sum that up, and this is one of the, the main thesis, thesis of tonight, is Europe needs to articulate a set of principles that prioritizes public values to help societal stakeholders create an open, democratic, and diverse platform ecosystem. Now, that is the ideal version of my story. But what are the challenges for Europe? And now I come to, of course, uh, had the main part of the last part of uh, my lecture. What does this mean for Europe? Uh, and Europe, once again, is a continent that does not own or operate any crucial infrastructure uh, infrastructural or intermediary platforms. So can we articulate a set of principles to help redesign or reshape that American platform ecosystem? And how can we do that? First, I go back to the United States and then I'll come back to Europe. But in the US, um, there's a over the past year, and this has been quite recent, but over the past two or three years, um, basically since 2016, sp 16, but particularly over has since 18, there's a strongly felt need for rules and restrictions that is now echoed in both the US and European countries, as well as the EU. And I will come back to the EU in uh, my next slide. 
Last um, November, no, I think it was October, it was before the elections, very strategic. The House of Representatives in the US presented its final report after years of investigations and public hearings that you've probably heard or came across, where the CEOs of the big five tech companies were questioned about potential abuse of market power and antitrust violations. Now, during those hearings, we heard multiple examples of their findings exposing Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook as what they called the walled gardens of vertically integrated services who abuse their data power at the expense of competitors and to the detriment of citizens consumers. That was one of the, uh, the conclusions of that report. Now, in those hearings, you may have seen, you know, little snippets of that, but in those hearings, we saw very different arguments coming from Republicans as opposed to Democrats. But they agreed on one basic thing, that tech companies' monolithic market power and their exempt status, referring back to Section 230 that I just explained, that needed needs to be addressed. Now, this proposal is now up for in the Biden administration will certainly come uh, to the fore over the next year or so and it will certainly be uh, uh, catch your attention. But let's first go back to uh, Europe because since 2015 the EU has certainly tried to mobilize various legal and regulatory frameworks to contain all those you know those backlash uh, malicious effects of platformization. And this resulted over the past few years in a couple of really important, I think, legal uh, 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 milestones. The implementation, for instance, of the GDPR in 2018, uh, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, that really set an important milestone for the protection of privacy. But that was just privacy. Um, in uh, 2016, you know, in 18 and 19, Google Alphabet was fined three times, not just a little bit, but really substantially for market power abuse. And currently, as we speak, Apple and Amazon are under investigation for violation of competition law. So those have been really important milestones. Um, so it's very important that the EU uses and adjusts its legal frameworks in antitrust, market power abuse, privacy, and so on and so forth. But the real problem is that they do not change the system as such. They do not affect the architecture of that American ecosystem. Currently, and this is a note that I want to add, the EU is working on a, what they call a Comprehensive Digital Service Act and Digital Markets Act. Um, to actually assign transparent responsibilities to uh, transparency requirements to platforms, while also protecting, trying to protect EU democracies. And with these two pieces of legislation, the European Union wants to impose stricter rules on platform companies, American companies mostly, and give clarity about their liabilities, what actually are their responsibilities. But to tell you the truth, I think those legal frameworks will appear insufficient to counter the fundamental, what I call, disruptive effects of platforms. And therefore, we should also work on changing the ecosystem's architecture and also change the way that it operates. Frankly, if you ask me, I don't think it's possible to create an entirely new ecosystem from scratch. Um, that is probably not going to work. But what we can do is to articulate, that's at the very least, we can articulate principles for a more open and democratic ecosystem design. So what could those principles be? What could be principles of an open platform ecosystem design? And I'm going to mention three, not, you know, th this will be my last uh, uh, topic. I would like to define core principles for the various actors that I just mentioned, the three types of actors, guarantee data sovereignty and promote platform diversity. Let me elaborate on each of those three very briefly for the sake of time. Here you see the first principle, the first uh, principle that I just mentioned, um, which sets out to define the rules for each type of actor in the platform society. Now, this is a slide that I took from the World Wide Web Foundation, which is in, uh, was uh, created by Tim Berners-Lee, 
the inventor of the World Wide Web, in 2019. And he wrote this very interesting manifesto called The Case for the Web. And he meant it to be a sort of, you know, Magna Carta, uh, sort of a Magna Carta to save uh, his original design of the World Wide Web as an open and democratic space. He was very intent on uh, uh, using that space for democratic purposes. Now, this manifesto provides um, a contract that contains core principles for the three types of actors that I just mentioned, companies, citizens, and states, who are, in fact, jointly responsible for the platform society. Last year, several of the major tech companies, including Facebook and Google, have signed these contracts, and so have some states that were involved in, uh, in, in uh, putting this up. But the problem is that many other companies and states have ignored uh, this, this appeal. And for those who did sign, participation is pretty much non-committal. There's no sanction for non-compliance. So this remains a sort of, you know, exclusive form of, well, self-regulation. However, I think it's an important uh, attempt. The second principle that I would like to outline is pertains to data, data and user sovereignty. Europe, I think, needs to define what data ownership is and uh, who, whom data belong to. For instance, data belong to citizens who have the right to control their use. Or a principle like open data belong to communities rather than to companies. Another example, in public organizations like schools and universities, there could be strict requirements as to who can utilize which aggregated data sets for the benefit of the common good. So data ownerships, ownership needs to be defined more precisely. Another rule may be data portability. You can carry around data to different platforms without switching costs. And switching costs are you know, the cost that it takes to switch from one platform to another. So to switch from one to the ne next, you should be able to carry along your data. And that should be just as easy as switching your bank account or your phone number, right? So data portability is an important principle. And finally, I think we need to look into the condition of data transparency. Data flows could, re be, could be regulated more or less like money flows. You know, we are used to be that being regulated in banks. And this might imply, for instance, that independent data accountants rather than money accountants are required to comply with those um, uh, transparency rules. Just an idea for a principle. Finally, the third principle that pertains to the requirement of platform diversity. How come, this is one of my a very basic question, but I keep bringing it up. How come there are so few public and nonprofit platforms, particularly at the level of infrastructure, you know, the root level of the tree and particularly the intermediary level? Why don't we have public social media networks similar to public broadcasting or as an alternative to Facebook? Why don't we have a public uh, social network platform? At the more technical level, we may require interoperability between platforms to counteract the current standard of intraoperability. Intraoperability is between the various platforms or of one company. That is the difference between inter and intraoperability. We could mandate open source software whenever possible. It stimulates innovation and it prohibits monopolies. And finally, we should look into public online infrastructures. For instance, I, th I know for one thing that Germany and France are currently developing a public cloud service, a service that is based on the condition, the public conditions for storage and distribution. This is just an example, but I think that we need to have more platform diversities, uh, 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 diversity in terms of private and public and whatever form in between, but there is simply not enough platform diversity in the current system. To conclude, um, and this is really, you know, sort of a takeaway that I would like to, you, you know, to, to uh, keep in mind. If Europe feels squeezed between the Chinese and the US ecosystem, we may need to rethink the architectural design 
the governance of platforms if we want to secure a fair and open digital society. I think this is one of my main points here. And therefore, the European Union should first make explicit the common principles for each responsible actor and then mandate them by law. Now, to end on an optimistic note, because, you know, I know I have sketched the ideal and this is like a, you know, a long time uh, uh, idealistic vision, but I still want to end optimistically. I see encouraging signs of public counterpower. There are several national and local initiatives to start and coordinate platforms for the common good. There are a number of civil society efforts that I sometimes I'm involved in or that I you know, share and that I promote, that some efforts to protect public values on the internet. And there's a raised awareness increasingly at the national level, at the EU level, also at the individual level, to protect the integrity of public space on the internet. Now, I would love to talk more about this, but I know that is pretty much stuff for another lecture. So I would like to give more, uh, spend more time on, you know, discussion and as far as that's, that is possible on uh, Zoom. But please, I welcome your, uh, your comments, your questions, and I will try to answer them as well as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, that was uh, a great and uh, also um, you stayed perfectly within time, right? Oh, so, um, thank you. <laughs> the, the, the chair always likes that. Um, um, there are already a couple of questions in um, in the in the Q and A, um, and um, well, I also have my own ones, but uh, I'll be um, I'll be uh, um, uh, nice and, uh, and and directly move over to uh, to the to the Q and A um, and start uh, just with the, the first question. Um, uh, by uh, by Divina, who says that um, when you say GAFAM is largely involved in corporate surveillance, how blurred are the boundaries between corporate and state surveillance here? Uh, because we've seen evidence of states using this private infrastructure to its own end, right? Right, that is a really important question. Um, I didn't go much into that. I, you know, in one of my uh, uh, first slides, I tried to go a little bit into how the boundaries are blurred, not just between companies, which is certainly true. You know, Google, Apple, uh, several are, they're both competitors and um, uh, um, actually partners. So they do a little bit of both and that's how they operate the system as an ecosystem. But there's also a lot of cooperation between state and uh, uh, corporations. And that in the United States, of course, you know, many um, uh, public sectors cooperate and operate with uh, some of the uh, big corporate, big tech corporations as one thing, you know, basically uh, a duopoly or um, they're hired by, com by uh, corporations are hired by public sectors to actually engage in communal research or communal operations. There is so the, there is no such a hard um, uh, distinction between state and uh, corporations in the United States as they would like to appear. And that of course is even more so in the, in the Chinese uh, ecosystem where state and uh, corporate surveillance is pretty much, you know, there, there are two hands on one body and uh, the state certainly controls the, uh, uh, the, the data flows that are operated on platforms by the corporations, but they have the last say in everything. So I don't think there's in that respect, of course there are ideological differences, but in some respects, they are the mirror images of, you know, the same uh, piece of glass, uh, the American and the Chinese system. So there's a lot of cooperation between state and market. And that is why in my explanation of the European system, I put so much emphasis on civil society as actors. There is, you know, it's very hard to define a balance between two state and market if you don't add this the the third factor which is civil society and that of course is very a very important balance in europe it's what's also called the rhineland model i don't know if you have heard of that but the rhineland model you can look it up um, is basically about the balance between those tri uh, the three powers state market and civil society but unfortunately in 
either one of these two ecosystems, Chinese and America, the power of civilians, the power of civil society actors is pretty much, you know, uh, neglectable. I mean, there's hardly any power that can be granted to civil society actors within uh, as part of that system. And that is why I'm so adamant in uh, trying to get across, please make, make sure in the European system, um, by principle and by, you know, the principle of design, give space, open space to public actors, give space to institutional actors we, who are usually pretty independent in Europe, and at least create a disconnect between state and market by promoting the space of civil society actors. I hope that is, uh, uh, you know, a beginning of an answer to your very, you know, important and significant question. I'm going to directly stay within that and then come back to a second question by Devina. Um, but Jakob Jünger is asking, uh, I think also related to this larger geo geopolitical um, uh, uh, space, where you see Russia-related platforms, um, um, such as uh, VK Kontakte, Telegram, uh, uh, and so forth. Are they like a, like a third model or a, a where do you put them on the map? Yeah. Well, actually, I have left out, and this is very artificial, but I have left out, uh, you know, some minor systems that do not have any global influence. Telegram is an interesting example because it's one of the few Russian originating uh, platforms that have become global in scope, but many of the other Russian uh, platforms have pretty much stayed within Russia. So except for these, you know, single platforms that have caught up with the global uh, uh, um, digital sphere, I can't speak of a particular Russian system that is, there is a Russian system, but it's pretty much self-contained you know, and it doesn't expand globally, except for those one or two, or two. And there's European examples as well. You know, there is no European ecosystem. There are, on the other hand, a few European unicorns. Um, there's more of those examples. There's in India, there's a couple of, you know, platforms that are becoming bigger and bigger. So we have to really watch um, uh, other continents and how they're building up and grappling with the same issue as the European continent is doing. Um, so I'm not saying that this uh, balance between the two ecosystems in the global and contested global sphere is there for once and for all. On the, on the contrary, I think it's a very contested balance that is currently uh, manifest, that's becoming more manifest by, you know, the day and the month. Um, but I don't think there is currently at this moment another global globally operating ecosystem that is a, a true competitor to the American and the Chinese ecosystem. And I also have to make another caveat, which is that I haven't studied the Russian uh, uh, ecosystem. So um, if... I'm now making a mistake. That's probably because I'm uh, beyond the boundary of what I've actually researched. But forgive me, I have concentrated on uh, those two who are pretty important in the global sphere. Yeah, no, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, there, there are quite a lot of questions and they're really good questions, I think. Um, there, are, there are several questions that I think are maybe um, almost like implementation details or, or specifications concerning some of the, the, the propositions that you made um, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the end. And maybe I just come back to Devina real quick, uh, who says that um, um, where should public funding be centered um, to, to defend the public interest in the, in the larger scheme of things, right? I think that's very interesting. You know, for example, that um, there is this European Processor Initiative, right? Which uh, I think we're talking about hundreds of billions of euros um, that, that really targets this very lowest layer of your, of your scheme. Me personally, I'm super skeptical about that, but um, uh, uh, what, what, where, where do you think money would be best spent? Well, yeah, that's a difficult question. Public money, which is public money, tax money, for instance, where could you, would it be best spent? Um, uh, for instance, let me, I discussed it very briefly, but the cloud services, you know, France and Germany are uh, trying to organize their own public cloud services, which is obviously a very expensive infrastructure. 
not as in, uh, expensive, I think, than uh, the layer like uh, uh, existing of cables and hardware, etc. But clouds are pretty important. I think actually you have to think about this more strategically. You have to think about it as in terms of what are the services levels in the tree that are crucial for um, sort of opening up the intermediary services to interoperable uh, um, uh, actors or interoperable principles. And one example I want to give is, I think cloud service is a good one to begin with, but let's take identification services. You know, um, there's now talk in the European Union about an EID, electronic ID identification system, that is the equivalent of the proprietary system of you have your Apple ID, your Google ID, etc., Facebook ID. Um, why don't we have an EID system that is public and that creates a... Um, uh, a sort of a, a nodal point of interoperability where you can use that, a public identification system, instead of, uh, uh, of your um, uh, proprietary identification. If you single out several layers of services, platform services, that allow you to um, mandate that interoperability principle, that might be more strategic than trying to build a tree from scratch. You know, you can't simply imitate an entire uh, architectural design for an, a new sort of ecosystem that uh, is going to exist alongside those T2 ecosystems. So you have to think more strategically and level at the services that are crucial in sort of breaking up um, the, uh, 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 the tying together of data flows. Identification services may be one. Um, indeed a public cloud service that might be at least provide an alternative in the public sphere to disrupt more or less that intraoperability uh, data uh, flow principle. So I would like to think of it more in terms of strategy. What would be the best strategy to disrupt the um, ecosystem in terms of its monolithic um, uh, distribution of data? Does that make sense? But to, to me it does, so <laughs> that's a bit uh, the difficulty of that uh, of that uh, setup. You know, um, this is so difficult about uh, giving lectures online. I don't see your faces. I can't, uh, ta ta you know, I can't tell from your face whether you have understood my answer or whether you would like a little bit more explanation. So forgive me if um, if this doesn't work for you, and you can always send me an email. You know. <laughs> But, but maybe actually continuing on that level of like more concrete elements, uh, Elizabeth van Koevering is, um, sorry is that I pronounced your name in a very Dutch way, um, uh, uh, is asking, because I think, I think, you know, her question is really, um, uh, um, we're talking about, you know, interoperability as this principle, right? And I think on the one side, um, on the one side, you know, the Digital Services Act, for example, doesn't have doesn't have anything on inter interoperability in there, and then this is uh, Elizabeth's question: is um, is is but 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 how to realize that, right? How can data be actually portable? For example, should it be should there be like a mandate for you know allowing you to transfer your Facebook yeah. friends um, into a different service? And and you know I remember in the ninety no in the two thousands there were some attempts in that in that direction, but maybe more generally, is that like the level of granularity that we will have mm. to engage with? Yeah, uh, very interesting question. I, you know, I'm not going into details here, but um, I would like to recommend to go read uh, Tim Berners-Lee manifest more precisely. And that one of the principles that he has uh, uh, pushed forward for is um, he would like to see uh, in terms of data ownership, which was one of the principles I talked about, um, data ownership can also be uh, uh, defined and designed more in terms of who, you know, if you are as an individual user, you have ownership over your data, how can that be stored? And he is designing, for instance, something called an, a, a data pod. You have your own pod, not your iPod, but a pod in which you store and uh, give other people access to your data. Now that data you can decide each time when you you know you you um, uh, you regul you regulate you take care of your own data pod and each time you can decide whether you give away your data to 
for instance, a company or to uh, for the common good, for instance, for research, and then it should be anonymized and it should be uh, 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 taken care of in aggregated form, or you can give it away only, you know, or you cannot give it away and it can be used uh, only privately. So that I think is a form of design thinking that uh, needs to be the the bottom layer of those principles. What is it? Who is in, in fact the the uh, the foremost owner of your data, and if you do so, you can also think of okay, who who can be using those data? Can they be used, for instance, for health purposes by researchers only? Can my data, for instance, if I have COVID and I, you know, I give away my data either to the pharmaceutical industry or I can give it away in aggregated, anonymized form to researchers, or uh, you know, I do not give it away. Is there a form in which we can decide each time, you know, that we want to give away or uh, take care of our own data. And that I think is interesting in Tim Berners-Lee uh, kind of thinking. It is talking about, he's talking about data, not just in terms of private ownership as an individual user or in terms of companies, but also in terms of collectivity, a common, you know, data for the common good. And that is something that I have missed so far in the ecosystem design. Where do data go for the common good? And where can they be, you know, uh, part of your your own determination, self-determination in terms of uh, what your data should be used for? Yeah, thanks. Uh, people in the chat are saying uh, they can understand you. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, although I can't see your faces. <laughs> uh, there are actually several questions concerning fragmentation. I think that's that's within the European context, a particularly interesting um, interesting uh, uh, point, right? Uh, 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 Nathalie van Remdonk uh, is asking, um, uh, she says, a push for diversification combined with regulation can also involve into decoupling along regional lines and threatens open communication between different jurisdictions. Um, so how to avoid that, right? And there's also further down a question. Um, um, yeah, which, which I think also maybe um, wonders about uh, from, uh, from uh, Panayota, um, uh, whether um, within the European context, um, there is this kind of value coherence, right? Or we're already a bit in a fragmented situation. So how kind of to, 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 um, to work towards a consensus uh, here? Yeah. Wow, you ask very difficult questions that are also very uh, profound. So thank you for, for, for asking them. Um, it really makes a lot of sense to, you know, to weigh against each other the uh, problems of fragmentation versus seamless integration. On the one hand, we as users act as consumers and we're interested in seamless integration of all our data flows. We're also, you know, we're very much uh, in favor of convenience. Convenience, and I think for to some extent, is the the enemy, enemy of critical thinking. And by that, I mean that if you just give in to convenience, seamless integration, you will stay within the vertically integrated data flows of uh, companies that for uh, primarily operate as, you know, for their own good, for their own uh, specific interest. If you allow uh, Diversity, as I uh, proposed in my, you know, European design, if you allow for diversity and interoperability, you run the risk of fragmentation. You run the risk of uh, the opposite of seamless integration, which is hindrance, which is friction. And friction being, you know, the opposite of, of seamless integration, friction is also good for something. At least it forces you to think about what you want to use next, what you, you know, the other choices that you have. If you don't have any choice, if you're just, you know, part of that, that uh, intraoperable scheme of one company, you do not have friction, but you also don't have the choice to um, uh, actually, uh, you know, go for, um, for other providers or to not give your data away to Facebook or to Google or uh, whatever. So, while I understand that fragmentation is the risk that you run or the price that you pay for too much interoperability and um, uh, uh, diversity, 
I the reason why I think it is important to um, at least post that conceptually or at least to re try to reshape the architectural design of the ecosystem in terms of diversity and, in, and, and uh, uh, choice or interoperability is that it makes you aware uh, well, let, let me put it this way, so that prevents you from becoming a prisoner of the, uh, the white lines of the freeway, the white lines that have already been implemented by companies. Um, I do think it's a, a risk that, you know, we're running in terms of fragmentation. On the other hand, if we allow one system to become extremely dominant in the world, then all of the different norms that are fragments, that are difficult to deal with, and that are also part of our, you know, a democracy that is sometimes very messy. But it, there's a reason why it is messy. It's because we have to take action also, not just at the global level, but also at national levels and local levels, where there needs to be uh, more choice in terms of what systems you can use. Yeah, thank you. Um I just want to reply to a comment in the in in the chat by uh, by by Amy, who's 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 arguing that um, that um, actually it's not so much technological development that we need, but education, and that for example this talk could have used uh, open source uh, conferencing software <laughs> instead of instead of Zoom. Yeah. Um, and, and I find this really interesting because of course um, there is no open source software that works well with 250 participants, which. I think is a good point for actually why we need uh, infrastructural uh, de development. But 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 I think you know maybe to formulate it in a question: how, how much is there? You know how much is this about like individual choice and education, and how much is it about yeah the you know the, the big statist or uh, or at least social democratic vision of um, of uh, uh, states acting. Well, you really nailed this question because uh, you bring it home to me as almost a personal issue. When COVID-19 first forced us as teachers to go online, um, uh, my first um, my first uh, uh, idea was to go immediately on an open source platform. I proposed this to my university. They actually did a few you know tests with the system. I pushed them to really you know invest in this platform, this open source platform, to become the the major uh, source of video conferencing for my uh, university. And of course, within a few months, uh, basically the entire sector of higher education in the Netherlands decided to either use Teams or to use Zoom. And this happened over and over again. And now I'm part of a committee that tries to implement those principles that I just was just talking about in the public sector of education. Because I think we need to, first, we need to be aware of, uh, you know, the, the principle. It's easy to say we need the principle of open source and implement that at the very least in public sectors. But then, of course, the software needs to work. We have very successful examples um, of, uh, you know, public software. Um, and I can mention a couple that I have on my computer. Uh, EduRoam, for instance, is a very, you know, small piece of technical software that I think is really a gem in the educational sphere where we have internet access from all over the world due to our uh, decentralized uh, uh, um, access points. Now, that is just a very small example, but I think if we would invest in public sector uh, uh, use of open source software, and if we would be a little patient and actually put some money into that, I think it could really work. The problem is that, uh, in my case, the university decided to go for, you know, they already had Office 365, Microsoft, and they said, well, Teams works perfectly, you know, in that respect. And Oops, within two weeks, everyone was onto Teams and Teams became the common denominator for video conferencing. The University of Amsterdam, I look, I'm looking at Bernard, is using Zoom. In Utrecht, we're not allowed to use Zoom because they have. So now what we're seeing is this, um, uh, you know, instantly, because we had so much push from having to to uh, uh, to use this, there was such a push to use this software. We're going back to the big five. Zoom is not part of the big five, but... Mm, I doubt whether it will be independent, but anyway, it's part of the Silicon Valley scene. Uh, but I'm sure that for reasons of seamless interconnectivity, seamless connectivity, uh, convenience, whatever, whatever, that's why we go for the easy way. <laughs>
we buy into Microsoft. So we don't have the patience. It seems like we don't have, uh, uh, but we have to put interest in sort of developing that open source software for the public sphere. So I think this is a really good case, a really good illustration of why, how come that we constantly choose for going with uh, the convenience and uh, the seamless integration rather than looking for friction. And to some extent, we really need friction to become critical users. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I mean, there's many more questions. I will not be able to go all of them. <laughs> I but see I, but more I think, and more questions. <laughs> yeah, no, there are a lot of a lot coming in. They're just really good questions. Um, uh, so I, I'd love to go through all of them. Um, but we'll see how long we go. You, you know, if you if you if you if you fall over. Uh, uh, At we'll one point, my voice will break down. So that's the sort of the natural end to it. <laughs> yes, but I, but maybe we can still go for for ten more minutes. Uh, sure. That's uh, fine. Jose Moreno has a, a very interesting question, and and I think a lot of us have uh, thought about that question, and uh, we'd love to hear from uh, from you. Uh, so Jose is saying, uh, how do you see the banning of Donald Trump and mostly Parler? Is this an excessive power from the platforms, and could it be read as a threat to free speech? So right, is there an overreach yeah. here? Um, Gosh, I wrote three columns for the Financial Times, <laughs> the Dutch Financial Times on exactly that topic. Uh, I can't repeat every argument, but the banning of Donald Trump from Twitter was an interesting moment because he was banned from that one platform. But interestingly, the response from other platforms at that very moment, the next day it was Facebook, then you know uh, um, he was banned from Twitter, from Facebook. Then the very next day, Parler was banned from the App Store. And that, I think, was a significant moment. First, you know, the first uh, thing was just about Twitter. Twitter had, you know, a grudge with uh, Trump because he, uh, uh, he, they kicked him off the platform. He, they deplatformed him. But in some respect, I found the, uh, the, the, the act of throwing Parler off the App Store, out of the App Store and particularly throwing out a parlor from Amazon Web Services, AWS, that I thought was a very significant signal. Um, because there, what you saw in those few days, just two or three days, I gave 14 interviews in those uh, just three days. But in those three days, what happened is that you saw how the connection, you could almost connect the dots between Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Am uh, Apple, between GAFAM. There, a cooperating community and they they handle the ecosystems uh, as if they were states right as if they were regulating the public sphere now on the one hand um i'm i will go into um uh, free speech in just a moment but on the one hand uh people were saying like finally they're taking responsibility for what they should have done a long time ago you know in terms of throwing them off twitter on the other hand there were people who were saying gosh, why do they have the power to do that? Why do they have the power to regulate the public sphere? They're private companies. They're not states. They're not governments. They're not people. They don't represent the people, for one thing. They weren't voted into office, Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, 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 and all the other, Tim Cook, etc. So, and this balance, actually, both were to some extent right you know i agreed with people who said twitter should have thrown him off a long time ago they should have taken the responsibility as a platform you know he uh, violated the rules many many times and finally they took the responsibility on the other hand i agreed with those people who said gee should they have so much power these companies should they really be in the position to decide as private companies what happens to our public public sphere and that balance is exactly what I was talking about in my lecture. What is the responsibility of platforms in terms of their being private companies, being responsible for allowing many, many, many voices on their platforms? If they do that, you know, they're choosing for free speech. That is a very American issue. You know, the Republicans were mad at Twitter for throwing off uh, Trump from Twitter because, you know, that was sort of limiting his uh, uh, free speech rights. On the other hand, there were Democrats who said, well, you know, they shouldn't have that power in the first place. So uh, that seeking that balance, I think, is something that we need to do in Europe. What is the responsibilities of uh, responsibility of platforms vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, 
the content that is put on their platforms by by users, you know, by third parties. So it's a complicated question, but it's an intriguing one. And I really want to sort of work out this example to show how the ecosystem needs more balance. And it's it almost perfectly illustrates what I was just talking about in terms of where do we put the balance between state, market, and civil society? And what is the European answer to uh, the current power of corporate uh, of corporations to regulate that public sphere? So basically, that will be my next article. I hope, you know, I'm looking forward to writing it, but I haven't really covered all the details yet. I'm still digesting what happened on January 6. And now I want to sort of elaborate and, and, and research what it does to the public sphere. Yeah, no, it's, I also think it's it's extremely interesting. And, and, and I think, um, you know, during a day, one can like shift uh, uh, through like several feelings about uh, about these, uh, these, uh, these questions because it's so complex. Um, I just want to maybe quickly come back to a, a, the, a question by uh, uh, Petra Salaric, um, who is asking, going back to your 2013 work, um, how you believe that uh, the greater development of platforms can impact intimacy between people. Um, and I just maybe want to uh, connect that question to something that um, I've noticed in some of my contacts with, um, you know, uh, governance, uh, uh, government bodies, um, and, and there is this question, how do we maybe react uh, on this level of public policy and potentially even regulation to these much softer questions, right, to, um, I mean, for example, uh, some, uh, 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 I think a year ago, about a year ago, Commissioner Vestaya used the term, you know, biopolitics to talk about the, 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 uh, the, the power of platforms, right? And, and at that point, I was on the one side really encouraged, like, like wow, you know, she's using a word that uh, uh, comes from Foucault, uh, but then really wondering about the, how do you make, you know, questions of intimacy or these like, like broader issues part of a discourse that works towards something concrete right and i think something like misinformation for example works really well right you can you can really imagine that in a relatively positivistic framework but 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 how to deal with 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 you know transformations in intimacy for example Wow, interesting question. And now I realize that in my connectivity book, I indeed talked about the button people you may know. Um, and I argued that the uh, negotiate or actually the the idea of intimacy was uh, propelled or more or less made possible by the features in, for instance, Facebook. Uh, Facebook had a people you may know button. And that sort of created a sense of intimacy um, that you know, you you tend to trust people you know more than people you do not know, right? So the people you may know button and uh, later other buttons created a sense of intimacy where even with people that you have had never meet ne never met or had never seen before. Now, this the question of intimacy. I think what intrigues me now, eight years after having published uh, the culture of connectivity, is the question of trust, and. Trust to me is perhaps an mo even more important question than the question of intimacy. Um, trust has to do with uh, how can you trust people who tell you something that you cannot know or that you don't know. So, and that is very relevant to the idea of uh, misinformation. I just said, I just explained that Facebook is now responsible for almost 50% of the distribution of news, uh, the news that consumers uh, uh, reach, that reach consumers. Um, in doing so, Facebook sort of takes the lead in explaining news to you. But the interesting thing is that people forward news to everyone. You know, the, your news becomes a personal news uh, line and news is a personalized thing, whereas before it was something that the mass media uh, 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 monopolized. Now, having a personalized news feed, in that news feed, it is much easier for you to uh, uh, to only look at news that comes from people, you know, that comes from people that you either know or know that other people are known that are in your bubble. And that, I think, that uh, touches on the issue of trust. How do we know that we can trust people on the basis of um, an, uh, a, a social network environment, a technical environment that almost 
uh, induces you to look at news in a way that is personalized, that only lets you um, uh, look at news that is brought to you by someone else, someone that you're supposed to trust because it's in your circle, it's in your inner circle. And that is actually, I have not been much involved in research. I think there's other people who have done that much, much better. Uh, but uh, that is an issue, the issue of trust and how trust is created in the context, the technical context, the social context of uh, uh, social networks uh, that I think is should very much be at the forefront of our uh, interest currently. Thank you. Um, maybe I think uh, uh, we've arrived at the last question. I think there are many more, but um, uh, maybe to end uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a concrete note, there were several questions concerning the GDPR um, that in a sense already, you know, works towards some of the things you have been uh, uh, mentioning. Um, but is maybe actually in practice uh, not that effective, and um, um, uh, platforms apparently you know have been ignoring uh, you know some of its provisions, right? So uh, maybe is that is that cause for um, for, for pessimism, yeah. also for something like the Digital Services Act, or yeah, that's a good question and very uh, very relevant and also very legitimate. We should indeed ask, look back on the GDPR and ask ourselves, did it really work the way it was intended? Intended. Um, to some extent, not. But what is what you really need to remember about the GDPR? It was the first time that Europe, as a continent, um, uh, issued legislation that uh, applied to 27 countries, that applied to all platforms, and that was so broad uh, that really protected one. If there is one single public value that Europeans value most, it's privacy, right? So, and it was. You know, in that to that in that respect, I think it is still a milestone uh, legislation that we should really you know care about. On the other hand, in its implementation, particularly in 27 uh, member states, I think there have been hiccups and there have been problems with uh, also with the way in which the GDPR has been circumvented, in which it has been uh, misapplied, in which it has been seen as a proxy for a lot of other public values. So in a way, what if when I look at the GDPR now, I think in a way, um, it, it was the first broad implementation of a public value protection, but it's still not um, inclusive enough, not broad enough. We should think much further than just privacy in order to make the GDPR work better. And GDPR was just, if it was anything, it was too small. It looked only at privacy and, you know, not the other public values that I mentioned in one of my slide, slides. So um, I think if we go to the Digital Services and Markets Act, I'm one of my uh, uh, contentions, one of my uh, questions is, are, is the DSA, DMA broad enough to tackle all these issues of a democratic um, protection of uh, public values? So that to me is much more important than did we really need a GDPR or I'm not, I'm critical, but only to the extent that the, the GDPR is still too small. I would like to see it uh, covering more than just privacy. And I think, and I hope for one thing that the DSA DMA, I haven't studied it yet in detail. It's only out for four weeks now, uh, but in the next couple of years, if it will be implemented, that it should be about more than just, you know, market value. It should be about democratic values. It should be about public service. And that is my true hope. We do need to experiment with European-wide legislation, uh, regulation. And this was the first actual, uh, in digital market terms, this was the first legislation that was Europe-wide and that was, you know, very much geared towards uh, implementing in it in 27 states. So I'm looking forward to its perfection rather than its sort of, you know, criticizing it to death. Yeah, I also think that with the Digital Services Act, I mean, what we now have, right, is a, is a proposition and that's going to evolve quite right. a bit. And I think there's going to be um, several points uh, in, in, in time where, you know, additional uh, consultation will be possible and maybe we should right. also try and take that uh, opportunity. I, I will just allow myself to slip in the last question because there have been uh, several going at that, in the direction. Um, 
I, I know this wasn't the subject of your talk, but but how, how do you think these questions that you raised concern the global the, the global South and, and maybe particularly uh, uh, Latin America? Yeah, very important question. It's the, the answer is very simple. I've never done research in the, into those areas. You know, neither in South America, neither in Af Africa. Uh, my colleague in at the University of Rotterdam, Pale Aurora, is doing wonderful work in that area. So you should really need uh, to look into her work. But I think it's extremely important. I think uh, you know we need a lot of research doing that part. Mm -hmm. It's simply that I didn't have time to do everything. But I very much welcome you know this take on the platform uh, society. Yes, you say thank you so much. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, Jana is going to uh, uh, close uh, this session. Maybe just one point. Uh, the lecture has been recorded. Um, and there, somebody has uh, asked, you know, what's going to happen with uh, that data? Well, first of all, that recording only concerns the video stream, right? Uh, so, um, uh, 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 yeah, that's the data in this case. Um, and I, I, I hope that this will be made public. I, I actually I don't know. So I don't want to uh, preempt uh, uh, anything here. But um, well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, again uh, to Jose and also to the participants. Really sorry that I um, wasn't able to get in um, uh, all of the questions. Uh, it's quite a, quite a multitasking uh, <laughs> thing uh, that yeah. has to do. Uh, but, uh, well, you thank you very much, all of you, for listening. And I very much welcomed your comments. You have great questions. So uh, uh, I really appreciate it. And once again, I wish Lisbon all the good of my heart from the deepest of my heart for all, you know, what is going, what you're going through right now. Thank you, Jose, for this fantastic time. Thank you, Bernard, for mediating. Uh, this conversation and thank you all for attending uh, I think we just uh, going to end the webinar yes and all the best for you all <laughs>